Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Crescent City Council meeting for Monday, October 21st, 6 p.m. And we'll open our session. If you'd please call the roll. Yes, sir. Council Member Murray. Here. Council Member Shalom. Here. Council Member Gastineau. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Holly. Here. And Mayor Aniak. Here. Thank you. And Council Member Murray, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Be delighted. Thank you. And pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We've just come out of a closed session a meeting, and Mr. Black, our attorney, do you have anything to report out of that meeting? Mayor, no final actions were taken in closed session. Okay, and we didn't complete our closed session, so we'll return after our regular meeting. We have no acknowledgments this, this evening. On our consent agenda, we have three items, the approval of the regular minutes for October 7th, the approval of the warrant claims through October 8th, or through the 21st, rather, and approval of our biweekly payroll for October 5th and 11th. If there's a motion for approval. Move to approve. I'll second it. It's been moved and second. Any public discussion on our three items for consent? Seeing none, would you please pull the vote? Yes, sir. Councilmember Gastineau? Yes. Councilmember Shalom? Yes. Councilmember Murray? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Holly? Yes. And Mayor Ennian? Yes, thank you. Under reports and presentations, we do have one tonight. We have a presentation by Nanette Yandel of the, on health in all of our policies. And come on up. Welcome. Good evening. So, does everyone have the PowerPoint up? get that set and we we also have it in our packets in our yes. agendas yes yeah. thank I'm, you i can go ahead and get started go ahead like. okay so my name is nanette yandel and i'm the public health policy coordinator for del norte county and i really wanted to share with you guys about health and all policies and talk about some directions that crescent city can take regarding health and all policies so the um this is slide number two it's really what health and all policies is and it's a collaborative approach to improve health by incorporating health considerations into decision making across all policy sectors and uh, across all sectors and policy areas. It actually started in 2010 with um, an executive order and it placed the Health and All Policies Task Force underneath the Strategic Growth Council. So at the state level, there's 19 agencies, offices, and departments that are included in this and it's just a way that we can use health, we, we can look at all the different departments through a health lens and I'll get into that a little bit further in a moment. So the third slide talks about what, why do we need health in all policies? So as you guys know, environments where we live, work, and play shape health outcomes, you know, being able to walk on the sidewalk, lots of other things. And policy decisions made by non-health agencies also shape those environments. So when we're talking about improving the health of our community, what we're talking about is improving those overall environments. So a collaborative approach that includes all departments is really necessary. And then the, the next slide, um, slide number four. So the first image that you'll see is, it's all the um, Crescent City departments um, put together and then what we can do in order to include health in all policies is to use a health lens and use a health lens analysis. There's health impact assessments and there's also health lens analysis. There's a lot of similarities between the two and what I'm proposing is using a health lens analysis as an evaluative tool and it can be used for the strategic plan, it can be used for the general plan. So it's really just looking at policies, a way of looking at policies and providing recommendations, using an evidence-based approach. It's a way that we can see where we're already including some health benefits or where there might be some challenges or other issues that we want, might wanna address. And there's five stages there um, of how to do a health lens analysis and it's really creating a project, having a plan, and then the policy recommendations would be that final report. And then if you go to the next slide. So a healthy community framework is 
one of the things for us to keep in mind because when we're talking about health and what is a healthy community, it's important for us to know. And also in your guys' packets, there's a whole paper on what is a healthy community. But a few highlights are that it meets the basic needs of the people in the community, that it includes the social and economic development of the people in the community, and it also has health and social equity, and these are just a few components. In order to have a healthy community, of course, we need to take action. I mean, that's, that's why we, all of us are here, right? So part of taking action that the Crescent City has obviously already undertaken, there's the list of 11 just examples of different things that have already been done. And these are examples that are actually health and all policy examples. So this is something that I've talked about to the task force at the state level, the California Department of Public Health. They're very excited to hear that Del Norte County and Crescent City are already taking these steps and already making these actions. But it hasn't been something that's come together in a way that is a little bit more systematic. So that way, you know, other um, entities like at the state level know that we're doing this work and that this is where we're headed and that there's resources available for us. Um, the, the final slide is actually the next steps that we can take in Crescent City for a health and all policies approach. The first, first one, of course, is a resolution adoption, which is really just saying, yes, this is something that we want in our community. There's a sample that I attached there as well for you guys. And um, the strategic plan for 2014, I actually was able to work with city manager and provide an analysis, health analysis recommendations for the strategic plan. And that's something that can be included. And sometimes it's just as small as changing some wording, but for us to understand that health is an outcome that we're all reaching to. And if we don't have, if we don't look at economic development and see how it's intertwined with health, there might be a, a disassociation between different community groups, different policies that could support one another that can decrease the resources that we're using and make them go further as well. Um, the third item is the health analysis of the Crescent City General Plan. And this is something that I can do and provide a report for you, all, for all of you. I could even have it available, I'm thinking by the springtime, and it can be just an analysis of where are we, what recommendations, other health recommendations, and where do we have to go? And this isn't, this isn't something that, oh, we need to change the general plan because we all know what that would be like. But we do know that what, what changes can help improve where we're already at. So it's building on our strengths. Um, the fourth one is a city employee wellness policy. So looking at the city, the personnel policy, there isn't currently a wellness policy. This is something that we can also do and include a lot of the components that we already have, but towards improving the health. And when we look at the examples, the employee pool pass, um, the healthy vending, all these are options that we're already doing, but it makes Crescent City a place that you know, people are, want to come to. They see the, the health impact that we're making toward our community. So other than that, it's really health as a shared goal. And I just wanted to share this with you and bring this to your attention and um, hear any comments or questions that you have. Uh, I have a, um, a comment. Um, we also have the crime-free multi-housing um, project, which I, I'd like to see added to that list. Sure. Because um, the chief and, and a lot of people have worked really hard on it, and I think it's been really effective. So Absolutely. no smoking and, and safety on the playgrounds and that type of thing. And we even got some uh, computers for one of the multi-housing, two, two computer rooms. Oh. Um, so, you know, for kids to do homework or people to do research and that kind of thing. So I'd like to see that. And um, so I heard you say that you would help us with this because it, it's, we have the HEAL campaign, but that was the resolution and then we, we are focused on the health of our community, mm -hmm. but this drills down a little bit more, it sounds like. So yeah. like the analysis and the strategic plan and the general plan part. So I'm really glad that you brought up the Hill campaign. I was actually hoping that you would. Oh, good. Um, so the Hill campaign, actually, I, I was working with the director because I was trying to see where we can go with the Hill campaign. That's something I talked to you guys about like nine months ago, about where we can go from there. And the Hill campaign, as well as a few other initiatives, are heading toward the health and all policies because they're more inclusive. So Heal Campaign is still there, it's still active. It's actually now it's spreading out a bit to the um, national level, but they're including health and all policies and working really closely. So it's something that as we're, it, it will come up as we're working on some of these different policies, mm -hmm. but just making sure that we have that broader approach. And regarding the other component, 
um, my position is funded through the California Endowment, mm -hmm. and that's to, to take health and all policies and bring it to the community. So I'm, I'm here to do that. Yeah, we already have them here, and I saw that. Yeah. I looked it up on the web today, too, and um, I believe the county adopted the HEAL resolution, yeah. too, for a count, so it would be countywide, which, which was really great. So, um, so great. That's all my, my comments. You know, I was, I was looking at this, and we, we actually, as a city, have done a lot health and all policies we have 11 items there that are listed on what we're doing as a city and we're trying to move ahead and even go even further we just finished our safe routes to school um, the other day we're not finished it but did another safe routes to school a couple of weeks ago last week Isn't that um, the walk to school walk day? To school the walk day, to yeah. school or bike to school day we've, we're working it we've done that each year we passed our social host ordinance housing inspecting we're doing that with our code enforcement yeah. And in fact, we're taking down houses that are about to fall down and are health hazards, health and safety hazards. We've done our smoking. We've done the, we have a public pool, our low income housing availability. We've been doing that for years. And our parks and recreation, we, we do, you've probably seen Kids Town out there. Mm -hmm. And we do have a lot of healthy activities planned for our new park. I don't know if you've seen our drawing plan. of all oh, the yes, stuff absolutely. that we have as we await funding for that. So. It's nice to know that we're that we're right in there with the best of cities Absolutely. on doing our part. Yes, and like I said before, the Health and All Policies Task Force at the state level, one of the questions they keep asking is what can we do to support you? So as we move forward, this is something I just talked to her earlier today. Like as, I, as we hear like different areas where we need support, that's something that I would like to help the city find those, those And we avenues. will certainly let you know as we apply for state and federal grants for our park to, yeah. to keep our community healthy. It would Absolutely. be nice to have a, a letter of support in that. Absolutely. Now, since I have your ear and you work for the endowment, um, speaking of safe routes to school, it's not in the city limits, but it's very close by, and that's El Dorado Avenue that goes down to the high school that passes by, you know, basically is a route between Joe Hamilton and Crescent Elk and Best Maxwell and high school. And there are like no lights on that street. Um, it's very, and there's a lot of kids that play sports and I see them walking in the dark at night and it seems very unsafe. Um, so I would like to identify that as a priority for safe routes to school. Okay, and if that's all right with you, then that's something that I'll talk not at this meeting with yes. you about further because I know some different steps we can take to go that direction, That'd especially be great. with your support. Yeah, you know, thank you. An another project that probably should be identified is the, the 9th Street uh, traffic project that we're working on. We're making improvements up and down that 9th Street oh. corridor, which of course goes past Crescent Elk and, and Joe Hamilton. So that may, should improve the safety significantly. For those traffic calming. Yes. Yes. We're adding bike lanes and then at 9th and Eve where uh, Crescent Elk by the cheese pack, Crescent Elk and Joe Hamilton are near. We are narrowing that roadway for cars to make it easier for adults and children to cross without being exposed to traffic lanes as much. And that's coming up this spring. And as you know, on the, the local transportation commission, yes. they just finished their infrastructure and audit study. So they're, they're identifying some of these communities. And at that last meeting that we had when, when they um, talked about the report, we talked about Crescent Elk in particular as an addition to with some of some of the um, needs that are around there re regarding traffic calming. And, and I'm glad that, that you're here to remind us because sometimes when you're on committees, you're thinking about different things and you don't always think about the health aspect, you know, aspect of it. It's nice to be reminded and to, to, to implement it in our programs. Thank you. That's uh, what Health and All Policies is about. I Thanks. have one more thing. Since we talked about bike and walk to school, Mary Peacock has um, a, a dirt field across the street and I, when I did the bike and walk to school I was talking with one of the teachers mm -hmm. and it's in the county but I was wondering maybe um, does the county have a help um, a noise ordinance because it's very disruptive to have the dirt motorbikes um, across from the school and it's making all this racket so maybe you could find out if there's a no noise ordinance absolutely um, I, I do not have an answer but I can yeah that's fine yeah. I, I understand that but I was going to um, mention it later on but since you're here I'll put you in the hot seat. Okay. Right. Right. Thanks. Any Perfect. other council comments? Just, just as you can imagine, the issue for us, uh, which is pretty consistent with everything we do, is, is the cost of implementing uh, yes. health initiatives. Yes. So I appreciate your comment on the proposed resolution that it says within available resources. Yes. yes. So, so the idea is to, 
to, to get the commitment, but unless there's available resources, we wouldn't be bound by that commitment, I don't think. Right, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm bringing the health and all policies approach is because it brings that economic development piece to health and equity. So it finds out how, are, how can we collaborate, how, you know, if um, the police are doing this job and the planning department's doing this job, is there some, over, I'm just using this as an example, but is there some overlap where we can decrease the use of some of those financial resources to have them stretch longer. And that's one thing that health and all policies can do. It's, it's not super structured because it's different for every community. So that health lens analysis, that analysis will help us see where we can maybe, instead of saying this money goes to this department, this maybe is for certain projects, it's gonna be a collaboration It will cut down the cost for both departments. I mean, that's overall, that's if, if we wanna help our community, the funding's usually the limit, right? Yes. So. Yeah. You, know, you know, the only other thing that I think about is uh, that we can provide parks and opportunities to walk to school, but we need the parental assistance yeah. in getting kids out from behind their computers and out playing and doing the things that we know are healthy. So is there an educational component to this? I, I know that's not really why you're here tonight, but it seems like that's critical to Under safe success. routes to school, there's quite a few different components, and it's whether or not the resources can be there. The current steps of Safe Routes to School in particular is to start getting neighborhood watch campaigns involved, and that's another way to bring the parent involvement in because there hasn't been too much parent participation regarding the PTAs. So this is one component. Um, strategies are always welcome about how to bring people together, and there's a lot of other community events that we might be able to start bringing more people together regarding that, but that's definitely a barrier. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for appearing tonight. Before we, we um, accept a uh, motion for approval of the resolution, is there any public comment on the what? health and all properties? Actually, there's no resolution. Oh, it's not a resolution. There's no resolution. On, it was a recommendation, a recommendation. Okay. that uh, Ms. Yandel was, was recommending to the council. If right. the council wishes us to pursue that, we can bring that back. So we you. can direct you to bring it back? Absolutely. Is there any public comment on the uh, health and all policies? Okay, seeing none, is there a direction from council? Sure. Okay, we have consensus to bring that back to us then in the form of a resolution, I take it. Thank you. Next item is public uh, comment, and this, this is the public comment period where any member of the audience is invited to address the city council on any matter that's within the jurisdiction of the city of Crescent City. Comments of public interest or in matters appearing on the agenda are accepted. However, note that the council is not able to undertake extended discussion or act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on a future uh, agenda. Any comments that are not made at the microphone are not in order and will not be part of the public record. And after receiving recognition from the mayor, please state your name and whether you're a city or county uh, resident for our records. And public comment is limited to three minutes. Is there any public comment at this time? Yes. Good evening, everyone. It's been a while since I've been able to make it down here. Uh, if you'll allow me, I'd like to talk dirty for a few minutes. Can we have your name, please? Michael Haver, and I'm a city resident. I live across the street from Beachfront Park. Okay. Um, I spoke to Mr. Palazzo today. And I talked to Eric and a lot of other people. Beachfront Park is starting to look like a landfill. Your trash cans don't work. You need, need more of them or larger ones. By, they dump them on Friday morning, by Friday afternoon, the birds are already taking the trash out and spreading it all over the park. Uh, restrooms, another issue at the park. Uh, the schedule is so varied on the weekends, your tourist dollars are going to the Chevron station, down the drain, and down the highway. Because the restrooms aren't open, closest place, they don't even buy gas, they leave town. I've followed them there. Uh, another thing is, uh, and this is not a drag on, where'd he go, Doug? Uh, we have a, an extreme lack of enforcement in the park, and that's due to short staffing. That's not Doug's fault. It's not, due, it's not the sheriff's department's fault. That park runs 24 hours a day. I'm talking vandalism, dogs in the playground, people pooping on the playground equipment, drugs, 
I sit in my living room window and look out the window and see the hash pipes and the crack pipes being lit up across the street from my house. And like I said, that's short staffing. If there's a way that we can increase enforcement, do everybody in the area a favor. And my dear friend here, <laughs> who's getting tired of listening to me, um, I, I try to set up some hard dates for public hearings on a dog park because I've got a base mobilized at this point and if we start now we can secure funding to build the park and keep the people involved in design and construction down to the volunteer level. I already have people. So I will try to work with Eric on that at all occasions and uh, he knows how to get a hold of me. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, do, I too did notice the, the trash this weekend and we were working on ways that we can maybe have an additional pickup during the weekend for that. And uh, thank you for the dog park because that's one of my main issues about getting that. Any other public comment at this time? All right, seeing none, close public comment and we'll move on to item number, actually it's item number five and that's to adjourn temporarily to the Crescent City Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency. So we will go over to that and I'll open that meeting. Would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Board Member Gastineau? Here. Board Member Shalom? Here. Board Member Murray? Here. Vice Chair Holly? Here. And Chairman Aeneas? I'm here, thank you. Is there any public comment on the Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency? We're not seeing none. We'll go to the consent calendar. We have one item to approve the regular meeting minutes of September 16th. Move to approve. Second. Okay, it's been moved and approved to a second. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. There is no director's report. There are no business items. Public hearing, there's a public hearing and this is to consider and approve a resolution entitled Re resolution number 2013-28, a resolution of the successor agency to the dissolved redevelopment agency of the city of Crescent City approving the long range property management plan prepared by the successor agency pursuant to health and safety code section 34191.5 determining that approval of the long range property management plan is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and taking cer certain actions as necessary and appropriate. Mr. Palazzo. Yeah, uh, Chair Nia, members of the board. Good evening, Gene Palazzo. The uh, staff report and property management plan before you is part of the dissolution of our redevelopment agency and is required uh, by state law. And, and in kind of a, uh, a quick, quick synopsis of this, any agency that had uh, property retained uh, upon that dissolution needs to prepare a property management plan bring it to the successor um, agency, which is this board here. Then I need to submit that to the Department of Finance, uh, which would be the resolution if, if approved this evening. Then this plan goes to the oversight board and gets reviewed and approved by the oversight board. Then I take that and then I submit that to the Department of Finance you know, for their approval. And we probably wait you know, several months to get their final approval on this plan. What this plan is, is to address and identify the properties that the agency has retained through this dissolution and, and what is going to happen to these properties. Uh, state law, and there's a couple amendments after you know, uh, the, the process, you know, the law was uh, adopted. Um, there's some amendments to that law to address some specifics. Uh, in particular, it would be uh, the properties that are retained uh, uh, for government use. Uh, in our property management plan, we have three properties that are, are used uh, by government use, and there are two vacant lots. So what the process is, is uh, upon approval, these properties go into what the, uh, I guess state law has deemed the trust fund. And, and the, way it, the best way to describe it is it's a magical bucket here in the sky that these properties go into that they're gonna sit until you know, something happens with these properties. State law says once you go through the process, the properties that are retained for government purposes can then be. Um, uh, How is that defined, Gene? 
local government or local go it's government purposes and, and ours is specifically local government it's for it's our city hall our police department and our housing authority so they fall within the state law once we get all the approvals through the department of finance then we can take those properties and deed those properties back to the city and that's a process we'll have to come to the successor agency then i'll have to go to the oversight board to have that approved and then we can you know, have those deeds you know, and assign those properties you know, to be in, in the city um, ownership. Good. You know, right now they're owned by the redevelopment agency, mm -hmm. uh, which, which does not you know, technically exist, I guess, exist at this time. Um, you know, and again, there has not been a lot of property management plans submitted or even approved. You know, when I was reviewing this plan, um, with our redevelopment attorneys and they're making comments about, oh, we, we just got some additional feedback from the Department of Finance on, on another city. Let's, you know, you know, take a look at your plan and, and add that so we're consistent with what the Department of Finance is looking at. So they're sh even evaluating and shifting on their review and approvals as this goes through the process. Uh, so our property management plan uh, is submitted and what the management plan addresses is these properties what the intent of these properties, uh, where they will go. Uh, as I said, there's three properties that are used for government purposes. I outline in the plan, you know, you know the, the address, the parcel number, current description, um, best of our knowledge when we acquired these properties and, and for you know, what the cost was, um, you know, history of environmental contamination kind of on down the line. The two properties that are vacant the uh, properties on item number four and five of, of the property management plan. One is property that fronts I Street. It's uh, right on uh, the walkway of, I guess it's Second Street, um, uh, Second Street right away, and right behind the library. And that property, it, as far as I can tell, has been, uh, we acquired that back in the late 60s um, as part of the whole uh, Tsunami Plaza area. It's been sitting vacant since then. Um, the steps after we get, you know, the city properties transferred, what I'll do is I'll bring back to this board, you know, for rec some recommendations and direction on, you know, what to do with that property. And that will definitely have to go back to this, the uh, oversight board. Uh, I've, we did a uh, analysis on that property, um, on, you know, potential value, and I included that into the report. Uh, I had a, uh, a, uh, excuse me, a letter of opinion of value done back in uh, April 16th of 2012 when we started uh, dissolving the agency just to kind of find out what uh, these property values would be. The other uh, site is site five and that site is a, a very small sliver of property next to the K-Pod building is the best way to describe it. It accesses, has an access pathway to the public parking lot and then also it actually connects to public parking lots uh, which is a vacant property so staff recommendation on that is to you know, put that into the trust let's um, go through this process get the DF to um, approve our property management plan um, have the city um, public building properties deeded back to the city and then come back and address you know how, how we can uh, utilize best utilize uh, these two vacant lots. Again, they've been sitting vacant for many years. Um, I, I think you know, we can um, address that at a later date. So it, with tonight's action, uh, you know, approve the long range property management plan, make a finding that the property um, is, is not a project pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act and direct staff to transmit the LRM to the oversight board and to the Department of Finance. Any comments for the council? Quick question. Yes. The, the trust, again, belongs to who? They just termed it as a trust fund. It's just more than. So a trust fund for the city of Crescent City? I believe. Let me. Um, and when I was talking to our, our attorneys, they, they, we pretty much just described it as, you know, it's, it's just labeled that. It's not really a trust fund. It's just labeled that these properties are sitting in. You know, they're going to be sitting there. It's not a, a physical or actual location. It's just what they've, the, the state law has named where these properties would be placed. 
I just, it's very, and again, I don't want to get in a situation where the trust becomes property of the state of California. It is not. Hmm. It is not. That okay. wasn't their intent. Gina, are these the only properties that are owned in this manner? Correct. The the only properties that are owned by the redevelopment agency. Okay, thank you. And we have the RDA Oversight Good. Committee meeting on the 30th. If it's any, it, we have the Oversight Committee meeting on the 30th. Okay. Yeah, if anybody wants to attend. Councilmember Schwann, do you have another comment? No. Okay. It, it, it sounds like, though, it won't go to the Oversight Committee until it goes to fine. Finance. Well, I, I submit the action uh, tonight to the Department of Finance. They'll receive that, and then I move forward with the Oversight Board and get their action, and I submit that to the Department of Finance, and, and the Department of Finance will have both actions, and then okay. they'll take a look at our plan. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any Thank public you. comment before we take further action on this, Trust Fund? Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back up front. Is there a motion? I'll make a uh, motion to adopt resolution 2013-28, a resolution of the successor agency to the dissolved redevelopment agency of the city of Crescent City approving the long range property management plan prepared by the successor agency pursuant to health and safety code section 3419.5, determining that approval of the long range property management plan is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and taking certain actions in con connection therewith. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Would you pull the vote, please? Yes, sir. Board Member Murray? Yes. Board Member Gastineau? Yes. Board Member Shalom? Yes. Vice Chair Holly? Yes. And Chairman Nia? Yes. Thank you. Next is public hearings, and we do have one. We're going to conduct a public hearing for the final grantee performance report and close out for the Community Development Grant, also called CDBG. And this is 10 STBG 6708, con uh, the grant contract and take action as necessary and appropriate. Mr. Palazzo. Yeah, I'm here and yeah, members of the council. Hey, we spent a lot of time at the last meeting in discussing our CDBG projects. I'm going to be very brief. This is uh, the public hearing and close out for the 10 uh, STBG. Uh, it's to accept the, uh, the grantee performance report and direct staff uh, to uh, complete that close out. The grant uh, dates back to 2010 and it was for rural human services a harrington house food bank casa and some public services which went to the municipal pool uh, tonight it's just you know hold the public hearings if there's any public comment and then take uh, council direction do i need to abstain from this before he uh, came on to our council i would think he he would not have I to abstain He's an employee of RHS. It's the same with me. I sit on the board of RHS, and this is before I came on the council. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I'm. Unless council has any questions. No. wondering if Susan was going to say anything. No? Okay. It's a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. Is there any comments on our closeout of our CDBG grants? Seeing none, I'll bring it back up to the board. Do you have a comment? Any? I'll move comments? to approve uh, the final grantee performance report for CDB CDBG 10 STBG 6708. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Would you pull the vote? Yes, sir. Councilmember Gastineau? Yes. Councilmember Shalom? Yes. Councilmember Murray? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Holly? Yes. And Mayor Ania? Yes. Thank you. Item number eight is. Oh, I'm sorry, item number seven. Thank you. Item number seven is to review and approve the general fund 2012 13 year end financial results and the 2013 14 budget update and consideration of a general fund reserve policy and take action as necessary. Yeah, Mayor Nia, I'd like to introduce Susan Mayor to present this item. Thank you. As, as she's getting ready, just, you know, this is good news uh, story. 
uh, on our general fund and, and just focused on our general fund uh, this evening uh, with the end of the year um, closeout. So I'll turn it over to Susan. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Susan Mayer. I'm the Interim Finance Director. I have a budget update for you tonight. This is October, and October is when we start to have year-end results for you. Uh, our external audit will be starting next week, and so although these are preliminary pre-audit numbers, we have a series of good news to present to you. In addition to presenting 12-13 preliminary results, we also have some updated information for 13-14, and it's actually fairly um, soon in the year to be proposing changes for you for 13-14, but we do have some good news in terms of a, a number of large grants that the city has been awarded that we'd like you to appropriate so that the staff has the spending authority to implement those programs. Our objectives tonight are to go through these um, year-end results for the general fund. We'd, because we have some good news, we'd like to revisit and have you discuss and consider a general fund reserve policy. This was a topic that you discussed in your budget workshop and because you have some good news at year end, this is a great opportunity for you to come back and revisit that. We have a, a formal policy in front of you to consider and adopt. In addition, because we had, again, we had some good news, we have a series of one-time uses of, for some specific projects that we're recommending that were identified in the strategic plan and also in the capital improvement um, plan that we're re recommending that you appropriate and take action on. With respect to the 1314 budget, we are asking you to look at the revenues, and we have a very uh, a series of um, adjustments to the operating budget. But the net result of those result the, the, of amendments will be to maintain a balanced general fund um, budget for 1314. So let's start out with the good news here: revenues. The city's general fund earned 4.7 million in revenues for the year, and I'd just like to highlight some of the 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 large um, sources that we have here, property tax, sales tax, and transient occupancy tax, which is the hotel tax. And each of these had good results for the year, um, in, including some one-time results. And I would like to say that of the 4.7 million we received, 200,000 of that was one-time and catch-up monies, um, we, which are, are, are good to adding to our fund balance, um, but in some cases they don't continue. However, um, in, with respect to a variance from budget, we had almost $300,000 favorable variance to budget. Um, in particular, we had some one-time news with respect to property taxes with the redevelopment dissolution. We had a one-time flow of money back from the redevelopment agency to the county. The county distributed it to all the taxing agencies, including the city. And so the city's general fund had a one-time pickup from the RDA dissolution. In addition, we had good news on the sales tax front that for the for year to year comparables we had a 7% growth and isn't that great news for, for our, that shows some real uptick in our economy transient occupancy tax had a 10% growth for the year and partially reflects the new hotel that opened up on the, the highway 101 corridor although there were um, nice increases for a number of the hotels in the area um, and so in total we had some strong good news now when the budget was presented to you in June, this information was not available um, be, and, and be, because we need to have budget monitoring during the year so that we don't have year-to-year -year surprises, end-of-year surprises like this. However, um, I thought it was unusual here in Crescent City, over 700,000 of your revenues were not receded until July, August, and September. Because the sales tax is advanced to the city two months in arrears, and because your hotels are paying you on a quarterly basis after the end of the year, um, and because we also received a number of catch-up payments from the county that didn't come in until July and August, this truly is good news that was not available at the time the budget was adopted. And so I think it's, it's appropriate that the, the city always budget conservatively for revenues. You don't want to ever miss that target because you're writing checks against it during the year. But in this case, you happen to have some good news that came in after the end of the year. So here we have um, the revenue um, good news. We had good news on the expenditure side, and it just so happened that you know every year there are budget fl fluctuations. But this year, both the revenues and the expenditures both had positive results. We had over 300,000 of expenditure savings for the year. And again, this is a, a fairly significant amount. We spent 4.3 million, but this was 300,000 favorable to budget. 
This chart shows you how that breaks down. 120 was on the salary and benefit line, and this was due to some vacancies across many departments, but particularly in the police department. In addition, we had over 200,000 in, in savings from, from vendors um, from the accounts payable side of the business. And, and what, what drove these? We had um, a, a large project for the revetment at Elk Creek that was deferred and rebudgeted in the 13-14 year. Our public works department was uh, assisted in renegotiating the propane costs at the community pool. We saved over 30,000 there. There's some e equipment deferrals in the fire department. There were some other overall savings, but in total, these added up to a significant sum, 200000 And so City Council is sitting with a, in a situation where we had 300, almost 300000 of revenue savings and 300000 of expenditure savings. And so because of that, we'd like to have you think back to the strategic plan that you've discussed and some of the other projects that you considered during the budget workshop. And I have to tell you, coming in and looking at these and starting to, to make a list of options for your consideration is very helpful because you've already laid the found foundation for this in adopting your strategic plan and adopting a capital improvement plan because those plans identify one-time uses of money and objectives that um, you have already discussed. And so the items that we have in front of you, I think, are, are items that you have already discussed publicly and um, sought input from, and now we're making a recommendation that you actually fund some of these, these objectives. I'd like to first start out with a reserve policy. And in your strategic plan, you identify as, a, as one of your important objectives is the fiscal stability of the city. And the city's general fund reserve has, has plummeted in the last few years as the city went through some fairly si significant economic downturn. And there were a number of very, very difficult budget years where very tough choices have been made. At this point, we believe that your, your fund balance reserve is really um, fairly low, given um, the economics of this community. At June of 2012, you had a, a $950,000 reserve, which was 21% of total 13-14 um, expenditures. Um, if the city council were to consider a policy that grew this to 25%, um, by investing 1% a year, we would make a recommendation that you invest 50000 to increase that reserve by um, up to 22% and continue that fiscal discipline to continue that going forward. As we consider an appropriate reserve policy, and there is a policy presented as attachment A to your report, we look at a couple different things. We look at the diversification of your revenue base. We look at how sensitive it is to certain business cycles. In this case, obviously, we're very dependent on the tourism and the inflow of, of, of visitors to support our hotels, our restaurants, and, and our, our gas stations. Those are the, the primary drivers of our, of our ga uh, excuse me, our sales tax, transient occupancy tax and sales tax. But probably more important than, than this is the susceptibility to physical and natural disaster. Because it's a coastal community, because you are sus um, susceptible to the, the physical um, dramas of the storms, the, the flooding, and other impacts, um, natural impacts. 25% um, reserve is, does not really give you a whole, um, as much protection as you might want to consider on a long-term basis. The other issue you have is the, the, the risk of the, tra the transit corridors coming into town because you're very reliant on really two main traffic corridors coming into town and, and they have their own challenges. Um, um, in terms of the stability of those roadways, and they're susceptible to the bridge failures and, and other issues um, with, with, the, with the weather issues. Um, and, and so we, we recommend this, this fund balance policy. Now, I want to make um, reference to a comment I made before. Remember when I said that 700,000 of your revenues came in after the end of the year? So when you look at a reserve policy of, say, for example, a million dollars, remember that the first 700,000 of that it's really just funding your cash flow because you're writing your checks to employees and vendors as you go through the year, but those revenues aren't coming into two to three months after the fact. And so, although from an economic point of view, you might target 25%, remember that the first 700,000 is really a working capital cash flow operating reserve. If um, the council choose to invest in 1% in their economic um, reserve, there would be additional surplus to an, of one-time monies to invest in one-time projects. And there is a list in front of you here 
that comprises about uh, three, three to 400,000 of, of one-time projects. These are all projects that the city council has considered before. The most important and largest is the fire hall remodel. This is a seismic project. This would be the local match for a grant that has recently been awarded to the city. It provides for the seismic retrofit of the fire hall in, in, the, in the city. The other smaller projects that are listed here include um, really improvements to various city facilities, including city hall access and efficiency improvements. There's a desire to make a, a one-stop um, public counter access to city hall. Um, there, there is listed here an additional investment in your code enforcement and abatement revolving fund. This is a fund that you started a year ago with some seed money, and that money has been invested and continues to be invested in removing blight in the area by um, addressing various properties with the intent, long-term obje objective, to lean those properties and recover the money so they can be re reinvested in additional code efforts. This proposal would add additional money to that, se that seed money that's in your code enforcement fund. Another item that is listed here is some right-of-way cleanup, and there are a number of city right-of-ways that um, um, are in need of some, some cleanup um, enforcement actions. And so this would propose a, a nominal sum to facilitate that cleanup. The signal replacement is really a second phase, and it addresses some accessibility um, objectives, including the, um, the countdown and the bird chirping and some other items that are um, the state code is phasing in, and so this would make improve, these would make improvements to the signal on Highway 101. Finally, there are two items here for police vehicles and fire vehicle um, contributions. These are items that were cut in the budget this year, and these represent the second of a two-year funding cycle for these, um, for these vehicles. And so there you have a list of 386,000. These are one-time monies that we recommend for one-time projects. The net results, and I've, I presented this information in two manners. I have a, a chart here, but then I also have a graph. The chart explains that although we had a $600,000 surplus, I need to remind you that the budget for the year was actually not balanced and had a deficit of 161. And so the combination of removing that deficit plus funding the reserve plus funding the transfers will allow us to end the year um, with a million dollar reserve, which represents 22% of our, our expenditures and represents a 1% progress in achieving a goal of 25%. I'd also like to show the same thing graphically. And I, I have to tell you, when I saw this chart, this is a fund balance chart, and it shows you that a few years ago, the city was fortunate to have $2.4 million in their general fund reserve. And I have to tell you, this chart looks like just so many other cities because all California's cities were dealing with the same dramatic revenue drops, the property tax loss, the sales tax loss. And if you were to switch out the, the name Crescent City with many other cities, the chart would look very much the same. So the, the good news is that um, although we've eroded the fund balance, it, the decline has stabilized. There was good fiscal discipline in your budget, good savings by the departments, and now we're starting to see an uptick in putting money back, uh, investing in our reserve to protect against the future. Let's move forward to 1314. Our adopted budget for the year was 4.5 million. And I, as I indicated before, it's really fairly soon in the year to start to make recommendations. Um, normally you would do a mid-year update in January or February when you had six months of actuals um, to rely on. Here we really don't have a lot of new information. However, um, we do have some information on a couple of key revenue sources. I did talk with the, the county the county assessor has completed the tax roll for the year, and those numbers are, are now locked in. Um, the, the assessed valuation for the year was, was almost flat with the prior year, just a, a notch down. Um, but the, new, the news that we do have on property tax is that we have the, the definite in lieu. The city receives two types of property tax, the tax based on the assessed valuation, and then also the in lieu portion that replaces what we used to call motor vehicle license fee. So there's two components. The DOF has locked in the VLF um, in lieu for the year, and so that's a fixed amount. And so we're recommending that you, you make that adjustment at this time. The sales tax um, also comes to you in two pieces. There's the 75% the that comes from the Board of Equalization, and there's 25% that also comes as an in lieu number that's set by the Department of Finance. That number has been locked in for the year. 
So we're making recommendations on sales tax to bring up your base for the 75% to equal last year, plus also to adjust for the new information that we have on the in lose which is locked in for the year. We also have made other updates, um, including the transient occupancy to update to match the baseline from the prior year. The last item I'll discuss, which is the, the last item listed here, is the um, department fees and charges. We have a one-time pickup from the gas tax fund. Gas tax comes to the city on a monthly basis and comes into a fund that's dedicated for those, those revenues. The, the general fund budgets a reimbursement from that fund at a fixed amount, but the revenues are variable. We've been, in, we've been in a situation where that fund balance has accumulated. We have 135,000 in that fund. We're recommending that the city um, move 100,000 and put that money to use in the general fund while still leaving a $35,000 reserve in the gas tax fund to protect against future fluctuations in that particular revenue source. So in total, we're making recommendations to update the revenue base by 252,000 of which the 100,000 is just a one-time gas tax number. We're making these recommendations now so that um, you don't have the same year-end surprise that you had last year. We're trying to make adjustments and, and make recommendations to you as we go so that you have a handle on where your general fund stands. We have a series of um, program appropriations to recommend and these really, rec the first five here represents money, third party monies and reimbursements we have received either for grants, insurance reimbursements or developer reimbursements. In each case, we're asking for the um, city council to give the staff the expenditure authority to accept and uh, implement the grant programs. This is the FEMA grant for the fire hall seismic re retrofit, the RV park reconstruction grant, the Elk Creek revetment project was an addition to the grant that had already been um, accepted and, and appropriated. Um, we had an insur unexpected insurance reimbursement and a developer reimbursement. Those are all additions to the budgets. We are, um, however, making um, two other expenditure recommendations. We are um, beginning to implement some budget monitoring techniques, and now we have a system where every pay period we track to see exactly how we're doing with our year-to-date payroll budget. And our report to you after the first seven pay periods of the year is that the general fund is on track to save, well, it has saved 55000 in the first quarter of the year. Again, this is primarily due to some positions that have been vacant. For the, vacant. Um, and so we're recommending that you um, recognize that vacancy and put the money to, to use. In addition, there's a small operating adjustment in the Public Works Department. So in total, we're recommending a million six in adjustments. However, the general fund expenditure budget is actually being reduced. It's, and the other funds are being increased for the capital projects discussed above. We're making some technical uh, recommendations on your cost allocation plan. The city has a very comprehensive cost allocation strategy. It's well documented. It's very transparent. It's printed in the budget book. Um, during your city council work budget workshop this spring, um, the City Council asked staff to go back and take a look at this. Over time, the, the cost allocation has grown um, significantly, and in the past year, some additional layers were added onto it. And so coming in as the, the interim director, I was asked to take a fresh um, look at the cost plan and to make recommendations. And I think that my recommendation to you reflects the current operating status of the city the general fund budget is growing again. You've just seen recommendations to increase your revenue budget. In addition, um, there are some other funds in the city that are experiencing declines and having, having some deficit challenges. So overall, we're making some technical adjustments to recommend that the cost plan be adjusted to probably steer more closely in line with your current operations going forward. So as a result, we're recommending um, de decreases in the public works allocations and in the, also in the administration allocations. And when I say administration, I'm referring to um, the city hall functions for the manager, the finance, and the clerk's department. And in addition, we're also making some other recommendations that actually have some savings in some of the general fund departments. The net impact of these changes is 300,000. I think that um, cost plans are a good business practice. They accomplish an objective of trying to measure the cost of providing services in all your funds and programs. I think the city has a, a, a very um, comprehensive approach to cost allocation, and I think that in particular it takes advantage of, of um, um, being very transparent on the cost of our different, different programs. 
And so this is our recommendation tonight to, to implement these changes to your cost plan. The combination of these changes here shows that we are recommending a 1314 expenditure budget of 4.4 million in revenues, 4.4 million in expenditures. The net results of all the actions I've just discussed with you is still a break even budget for 1314 and shows that we are maintaining the million dollars in 22% um, fund balance reserve. We have one last item to talk about with you. Um, and that is construction management. As I mentioned, we are on the incre incredibly fortunate position of having three very large grants with three multi-million dollar construction projects. And this includes the CDBG 12th um, Second Street sewer project, the um, R um, RV Park reconstruction project, and then finally the new fire hall remodel that's, that's just recently come onto the books. Um, we have been relying on a retiree, Mike Young, to provide our construction management services for us. Um, we're at this situation now where Mike actually wants to retire <laughs> and, and he's advised the city that he will be- Again. <laughs> um, we'd like to conclude his work with the city. Um, we have been very fortunate for him to have his expertise. We are um, proposing to you an in-house construction management position to continue that function. And, and as, as the finance person, I will tell you that these large projects put risk to the city. We've got these grants, now we need to deliver on them. We need to make sure we are following our grant compliance requirements in terms of the bidding, the contracting, the, the monitoring. We need to make sure that the costs are, are controlled, the progress is controlled, that they are delivered on time. And in protecting the city's cash flow, we need to be sure that we're on top of the cash flows, the payments to these vendors. We need to be sure that we are getting reimbursed on a timely basis. $3 million, that's as much money as we have in the entire treasury. So it's, it's important, it's in the city's best interest to have active construction management when dealing with the scope of the projects that we have in front of us today. So we're re recommending um, that we have some in-house construction management. The actions in before you tonight are to adopt a reserve policy, to approve 12-13 year-end project transfers, to approve the proposed 13-14 budget amendment, and finally, to authorize a project management position within the Public Works Department. And that's my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you, Susan. Any council comments? Yes. Yes. Um, several months back, I um, brought it to uh, staff's attention that we already had a 25% policy in place uh, for reserves um, from back in like 2007-ish. And I believe you were gonna look into that. I don't wanna, I don't see a reason for us to adopt another policy on top of one that may still exist on the book. So did, were you able to find that? We have not found that as a, as far as I know, that's been a, a verbal policy. It hasn't been anything written I, I believe that we d adopted a resolution. That's why I think he was going to have Robin check it out. But um, I don't know. Is there is there a problem with adopting another one on top of a policy that exists? Or I guess not, probably. This would just replace anything that's you know, in existence. OK. Our goal could still be 25%, though. Uh, council, uh, council member, if I could. Um, just to reinforce that, um, one of the recommendations that I discussed with the city manager is printing that policy in the budget book each year so that as the council turns over and as the staff turns over, it, it's just, it's, there. it's a good reminder. Uh, and so that would be a recommendation for next year. That's a good idea. Um, on the gas tax, is there any uh, restrictions on how that money is used instead of just putting it into the general fund? Yes, it must be spent on uh, items that are defined by the state um, street and highways code. The city does have 100,000 of expenditures greater than um, we have been reimbursed by the gas tax fund. So this would maximize um, the, reimburse, the eligible reimbursement. The general fund has a streets program. We incur money during the past fiscal year, the general fund taxes supplemented the, the gas tax money by 100,000. So this would make for 13, 14, we would be getting a gas tax reimbursement for 100% of our street costs. Okay, so that, that money wouldn't actually be put towards any of these projects that we are about no. to possibly approve? No, it must okay. be spent on street projects. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, on construction management, uh, 
are you looking to go out and hire somebody? Yes. Or promote from within? Uh, it'd be a recruitment process. Okay. And I don't know about how anyone else feels, but I would strongly recommend that we possibly um, combine the position of account analyst uh, so that we have somebody, it's, that's a position we've already approved um, that has been vacant. And so it'd be really great if we could have somebody on staff that is an accountant level, but also project management, construction management. Yeah, I'd be looking at two separate positions, you know, and you know, Ms. Mayor and I have, you know, talked about that and when our new finance director comes on board, we'll be moving forward with the, the finance position that's already in the budget. Uh, this would be, you know, a different position for just construction, you know, project management in the public works department. So you so couldn't combine the two? I wouldn't recommend it. There are two different functions that, that we're looking uh, to achieve in, in those you know, positions. Okay. They seem to have a lot of similarities to me, but. Well, you know, there's going to be a lot of, you know, they're going to work together, uh, okay. absolutely, on, on these projects. But, you know, the finance, you know, the, there's a lot of other items that we need to take a look at within our finance department uh, that that analyst or, or person would be doing. Okay. Um, and before we talk about the individual projects, I wanted to just thank you because um, having this kind of um, good news in October um, and actually presented to the council in such a constructive way um, is a very, it's just a, um, it's very helpful as a council person to have this kind of information along the way. And I think that it's um, a very good way for us to start um, a new practice um, and so that we, you know, I, I feel like I've been on this council for a long time and as we, we move forward and we grow up and we, uh, you know, have all of these things come and go at us, projects that, um, and rate increases that a lot of times, uh, you know, we're learning as we go. And so having um, strategic information on an accountant level um, is really helpful as we decide to make these big decisions. So I wanted to say thank you. Um, I was the one that asked for this cost allocation to be um, looked at um, and because I was, you know, I have the benefit of seeing this budget for over several, well, seven years now. Um, and so I thought it was really important and I think that you did an outstanding job. And the fact that we were able to come in at the end of our year with positive news to, um, you know, kind of balance the scales. Um, doesn't always happen and we are used to seeing our revenues from the state coming in you know post quarterly um, but usually we don't have the positive news to balance it out and you know with the decline in, in the um, revenues that we've received in the past it wasn't always a pretty picture so I feel really good about this today and I just want to thank you for that thank you is there any other council comments at this time I, I just uh, a question, I think, and I, I too, actually, I want to make a comment. I too appreciate this. The good news is, is that it's very good news. If we do it again and it's bad news, we will have caught it early enough along in the year to make some adjustments. And so I think this is, uh, hopefully we can continue to do this year after year. Um, one question though, when we deal with the budget amendments, I notice that the uh, construction, construction project management position is not a part of, of any change in, in expenditures. Is that because it's, it's a targeted net zero impact? We're hoping to get the, the, the manager's money back from the respective grants? Is that why? Exactly correct. The okay. grants, these are, it, the costs um, for the manager would be grant eligible. So they would be charged out to the projects on a timesheet basis. The position would live within the general fund but would be charged out to the project. And so there's no budget impact. Okay. And the only other thing I would ask about that position, uh, Jean, is what, what happens, I know hopefully we'll continue to receive grants and, and, and uh, construction kind of activities. What happens if those don't come through? Does this, do we locate this person to our area and then we rethink what they're doing or, or what, what is the plan long term? You know, long term, you know, we have a list of grants, you know, that you know, we're pursuing, um, you know, this position is going to have to be built out to 
you know, the, that construction, you know, those construction projects you know, at this time. There is no other way we can, you know, a, a address this type of position. That's a very good point. And so it I is. would think that it would be really important that as you recruit that you, in the recruitment, are very clear about this being a grant-funded position and it could last three years, hopefully. <laughs> And okay. I, would, I would have a hard time understanding anybody that might move for a grant-funded position, but... But we have beachfront and uh, front street master cool. plan redesigns that will and, require and that. When we do all these projects, we need to come to the city council with a plan, a budget, on how these projects are, are going to be implemented. And in that budget, we need to include staff time on, on how those projects are going to be managed. And are we going to contract this position and not pay benefits? Or because the benefits can't be cost allocated to the grant? I would assume. Maybe I'm wrong. Each grant's a little bit different. Um, some of them, um, I'll just say that each grant has a little bit different, different rules on that. But you know, okay. we have a commitment toward eliminating blight. And I could see a situation mm -hmm. where there's a transition if we run out of grant work, that maybe we would make the decision that that would be a priority because this person will come in with that skill set mm -hmm. on how to deal with some of those blight issues. And um, so I wanted to thank the staff too. Um, getting $3 million in grants is huge. And um, I believe that the fire hall retrofit is the only one that required a matching fund. Is right. that correct? Right. Um, so. Um, this uh, good news is really helpful for the fire hall uh, retrofit. I think the RV, really important. the RV project required a matching Small. grant, but we are able to do that with the existing funds in, in, the in that enterprise fund. That's correct. Okay. Well, that's what I asked. Um, so anyway, I just think that that's really significant to point out. Any other comments? Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Is there any public comment before we, we go any further? Seeing none, we'll move on then to council on the, uh, the uh, fund transfers. Is there any comments? Um, are we going to take them line by line or? Yes, let's do it line by line. Okay, well, any. first I will make a motion to adopt a general fund reserve policy of 25% of the um, city of Crescent City's, uh, what do you call it, the fund balance? Attachment A, is there a second to that? I'll second. Been moved and seconded. Would you pull the vote? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Council Member Murray? Yes. Council Member Shalon? Yes. Council Member Gapsano? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Holly? Yes. And Mayor Ennia? Yes. Item number two is to approve the 2012 13 year end transfers and projects appropriations as outlined in the staff report. I would move to approve the 2012 13 year end transfers and project appropriations as outlined in the, by staff. Is that the one with the projects? Okay, I would like to actually discuss that. Sure. So I'll, okay. I'll second that, but I would like to discuss it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Uh, if you look at the list, which I believe is on page... Three, or five. Five, correct. Yes. So um, there's $386,000 in, in projects. And I just wanted to bring this up, and I'm not, I'm not a huge proponent of what I'm saying, <laughs> um, but I was curious about the City Hall access and efficiency improvements. I know that it's important. Is it really a $45,000 project? Do we have an estimate? Because I would, I would really like to see this council consider putting more than $50,000 into our reserves. That is the best estimate that I have at this time. That project is, you know, I've been talking about it for over a year now. We've targeted trying to get CDBG funding, you know, to address that. Uh, to have CDBG fund the uh, project for city halls is impossible. It's not, right. not going to happen. So, you know, at this point, um, it, it's what we're asking the council to do is to you know, use the general fund. Uh, no, I understand the project. I'm so, just curious so if it's actually a $45,000 project. Yes. And are we going to use in-house? No, it would be um, probably, con you know, the construction of that project would probably be out to bid. Okay. But if we do have leftover money, we could consider putting it more into the reserves. 
Yeah, I don't. Project. I don't expect that, okay. Mayor. That's a good thought. Did you have another comment? No, that was the only one on the on the list that I was questioning. Okay. Any other comments on that before we vote on those seven projects? If not, would you pull the vote? Yes, sir. Councilmember Gaspineau. Yes. Councilmember Shalom. Yes. Councilmember Murray. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Holly. Yes. And Mayor Ania. Yes. Thank you for that. Those projects are going to go a long way in our communities, especially the fire hall. That has been planned for a long, long time, and it's finally becoming a reality. Well, there, can I ask a quick question about that? Will there be any uh, public input on that project? Next item on the agenda, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. I, this, the fourth item is, uh, the third item is, to approve the 2013-14 budget amendments as outlined in the staff report. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any further discussion on that item? If not, would you pull the vote? Council Member Shalom. Yes. Council Member Gaspineau. Yes. Council Member Murray. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Holly. Yes. And Mayor Ania. Yes. And the last item is the staffing authorization for Public Works uh, project management position. Can, can you tell us a little more about that? How? What is that process going to look like? Are you going to come back to us with a job description and and a budget amount, or? We will have to you know redo a project description for project manager. Uh, right now it's allocating you know the position and I need to work with our public works director you know on the, the specifics of um, tasks for that you know position I think the intent is you know to take a look at and see if we either you know we have two options either you know full-time in-house staff or contracting you know that position out um, you know we have to evaluate you know the quality and who we can get to you know help us out uh, all these projects, you know, there, there's variances in each one of them. Um, the projects need to pay for for the project manager, uh, you know, position. Right, and and normally with a grant, you have to expend the funds before you can be reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, budget line item are we going to take this money out of in transition before we get reimbursed? Well, all grants are are done on a reimbursement basis and we have the authority to write the checks and so the city's treasury floats the cost until there's a reimbursement but we recognize the revenue at the same time as the expenditure so there's no impact on the fund balance just on our cash flow it is a significant investment of cash flow to the city to fund these grants so the cash flow comes out of whatever uh, if it if they're working on the sewer project it's going to come out of the sewer It'll come out of the sewer funds or sewer project, you know, depending on how that project is allocated to address staff time. And right now, the sewer project, um, all the CDBG money is going into the project, and we've allocated staff time to come out of the sewer, you know, you know fund uh, itself. The fire hall grant um, is, I forget how the, the city has a capital project fund where these projects will be seated, and that's where. Um, the 1314 um, appropriation will be sit sitting in the, the capital projects fund. And so as time is allocated on a timesheet, those costs are charged to the project in that pro in that fund. Right. Whether or not it's the RV park project or the fire hall project right. or the sewer project, time cards would charge the time to those different project budgets. Right. I, I understand. Um, I was just um, concerned about the cash flow and where that might come from on an interim basis so but if you're completely comfortable with it then I am you're right on on track because it's the same challenge for the checks we write the contractor right in fact the staff is a, a small portion of the cash flow the city will be absorbing while the constructions are under project the construction management's a small percentage compared to the checks that we have to write to the contractor it all has to be billed and reimbursed on a timely basis any other council comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approve, to approve. I'll, I'll move to approve the staffing authorization for the Public Works Project Management position. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Would you pull that vote, please? Council Member Murray? Yes. Council Member Gaspineau? Yes. Council Member Shalom? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Holly? Yes. And Mayor Ania? Yes. Item number eight on our agenda is to consider and approve resolution 2013-27, a 
a resolution of the City Council for Crescent City designating the City Manager as the authorizing agent for the Hazardous Mitigation Grant Program for the Fire Hall Seismic Retrofit Project. Mr. Uh, Taylor. So I've uh, <clears throat> prepared a short PowerPoint presentation. It's been a while since this project's come before the Council, so I'm just going to go over the history of this and how we are where we are at today. Everybody knows the, the City Fire Hall is located at 520 I Street. It's kind of centrally located in our city. Um, it's obviously a very vital uh, facility for our community. I'll just give you a little background, uh, some statistics. The fire hall was constructed in 1957. That was the original structure, uh, about 500, uh, 669 square feet in size. And the 2,000, uh, 885 square foot addition uh, was added. That was the new equipment bay. Right now, the fire hall consists of one two-story structure that kind of has the downstairs meeting and uh, kitchen facilities. Above that, there's some rooms for the firefighters, some equipment storage and changing facilities, that type of thing. Um, the main portion of the fire hall is a, a kind of an extended roof. It's the uh, engine room, so that's where they have the four bay doors out front there. And then you have a 32-foot-tall uh, uh, hose tower. So a little bit of history on the, on the grant, how we got there. In uh, 2011, uh, we completed our hazard mitigation plan. We actually got a grant for that uh, project. Uh, once we had that in place, and then that, that plan identified some different natural hazards and facilities that would be at risk, and obviously the fire hall and the, the seismic event were top priorities on, on that plan. Um, after we adopted that plan, that made us eligible to apply for some of these FEMA grants when they came available. So timing was pretty good for us. In 2011, we adopted the plan, and in 2011, we had uh, the tsunami that, that hit Crescent City. Um, so when that natural disaster happened, and especially for the affected counties, we kind of get a little higher priority for some of this funding. Uh, so we were able, they made the announcement that uh, the funding was going to be available due to that uh, event. And so in 2012, uh, we applied for the hazard mitigation uh, grant, and that was for the size of the retrofit of the fire hall. Uh, we received word that we were going to be funded. We were actually invited at that point we were invited to submit an application and then our project was approved uh, about six months after that time so here we are in 2013 we just received the award letter uh, we're kind of waiting on some of the because these are FEMA monies they're uh, you know NEPA National Environmental Policy Act applies so we're waiting for a lot of that to be, to, to be dealt with so that was taken care of uh, FEMA awarded the, the funding to us uh, in the amount of 680 $6,966. So, a little background on the project itself. Uh, this is actually taken uh, from the 1994 uh, Northridge quake that happened in Southern California. And I actually wanted to get some photographs of the, the fire hall. Uh, it was number 70 down there that was damaged, but I couldn't find any, so I kind of threw this in. It could be any typical house in Crescent City. We have a lot of aged facilities, um, older structures that don't meet current seismic. Uh, standards, and that's kind of where we're at with the fire hall that was constructed in 1957. And I put this in here, and this is the, the action report from the 1994 event in Los Angeles. And if you'll note, on, just in this action report, and this is for Fire Station 70, this was, they were actually in Northridge when the, the quake occurred. But the front apparatus doors jammed in the closed position. So what happened, their facility was damaged during the quake, and they were unable to open the bay doors not only could they not get their equipment out, they couldn't even get their personnel out. They were stuck in the building. Uh, they have 24-hour man facilities down there, so they were asleep at the time or in the structure. And they actually had to uh, break their way out the back uh, door of the building to actually exit the structure. Uh, so as part of this grant, in 2012, we had Veneer Construction Management and CYS Structural Engineers uh, complete the seismic retrofit study. And a little before that, in 2005, we had used some CDBG funding to do an initial study on the fire hall. And basically what, what came out of both the studies is that the biggest problem we have with the fire hall is it has a substandard lateral system, which means that basically the shell of the building is only supported by gypsum board, which is the interior uh, wall sheeting, kind of like your sheetrock. And we have a transit, uh, it's an asbestos siding. There is no plywood or lateral structure on the building. That's the only thing 
laterally supporting the building. So what that means in a seismic event, uh, once we start to shake, what happens, you get, it's called drift. The, the building starts to sway, <laughs> the building starts to move. The more drift, the weaker that structure becomes, and basically it builds on itself. That structure just will hit critical failure and most likely will collapse any size of that they may have. So this project, and the other thing is that what they found in that uh, study was there was very little anchoring of the building to the foundation, which is an, another pretty uh, big issue. And um, the roof structure, as well as, as the walls, the roof also does not have that uh, lateral support. So improvements that were proposed to bring this, so the one thing we have to keep in mind, the, the grant just is going, is going to only fund the seismic upgrades to the building. So the improvements that will bring the building up to standards and protect our structure are add, add sheathing to the exterior and interior walls. So this means all the existing siding, asbestos siding is going to come off the building. We're going to have to tear the roof off the building. Um, all the interior board is going to come off and be replaced. We'll resheet the building with plywood. Uh, we're going to put on a new hardy plank siding. We'll re-roof the building. Probably use a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably use a membrane roof. And uh, then we'll put all new uh, wall board inside the building. And the other big portion of this is the steel moment frame around the bay doors. Um, that's why I brought that action report up uh, from the uh, 94 event down in Northridge. Our bay doors, we have four bay doors right now. And what we're proposing is to put a steel structure around those bay doors. So the other that came out of this report is there's almost no support around those bay doors right now. The walls have little or no support around them. So in the event of we have a seismic event, we're probably going to experience the same thing. Those doors won't be inoperable. We won't be able to get any equipment out. So the steel moment frame is basically what it is. It's a steel structure, heavy-duty steel structure. It'll go around those bay doors, and then we'll have some new uh, foundations and footings, and we'll you know, be cemented concrete. And then and the other thing, we'll add more anchoring of the structure to the foundation. They'll add some more anchor points uh, next year to the building. And this is kind of schematic uh, to show you the existing fire hall and some of the upgrades proposed. Uh, shot of the roof. And then these are some elevations of the existing fire hall. So here's the fire hall, and as you can see, we have the four bay doors out front. Uh, so the steel moment frame obviously will go around the front of the structure. And that's the east wall, again the north wall, the south wall, and the west wall of the building. So all of the siding, you'll see this whole building will actually be resided. We'll have new sheeting across the whole structure. And the engine bay roof. This is a roof that will be replaced. This roof will be torn off. All the Existing sheeting will be removed, new sheeting will be put in place, new roof. Now, existing bay doors, and what we're proposing, which is kind of a good opportunity for us as well, was to, I know the currently these are kind of small uh, bay doors. The engines have kind of grown in size over the years, so they have, they're a tight fit for the firefighters to back their equipment in. Um, so what we proposed is to replace the four bay doors with two bay doors. We've also, what they've tried to do is to capitalize and get them as high as they possibly can get for clearance. And having the two doors gives you more width there to maneuver the engines and get them in there properly. So this is kind of a look, it'll be an after look, um, some uh, architectural renderings. And kind of give you a, a bit of an idea what the uh, facility will look like after the So as already, Sue's already mentioned in, in her report, uh, we've been awarded the grant funding. Um, the award amount, the total project, I'll say, was is about, we estimated $915,954. Uh, the award amount then was for $686,966, and our match was $228,988. Uh, obviously, the budget is good news. Um, that was one of the things we were faced with when we asked for this grant, was how are we going to come up with the match? 
I mean, this is great news. We're not looking at any type of debt service for this facility. It's, it's, it's a huge project for our community. Um, we definitely living in the, the high seismic zone that we live in. And we have, there's, we're looking at Cascadia event. Uh, we also have the triple junction to the south of us. Uh, we know just a few days ago we had a quake down there. It was felt up here. So there's a high, high probability that we're going to get a probably decent sized event sometime. Um, again, tonight, what we're asking for is the authorization for the city manager uh, to be the authorizing agent. So as part of accepting the funds and being able to expend the funds, we have to designate that person, and that needs to be done by resolution, and that's what we brought forth tonight. Thank you. Is there any council comment? Um, I, I had a, just one quick question. Eric, will the um, bay, new bay doors, will you be able to open those manually in case there was a power outage or the trucks could get out? Yeah, they'll always have that back up and then they can open it okay, manually. Okay. And Steve could probably answer that a little better, how they're set up currently. Because it didn't sound like that other fire station did. Well, they were just unable to open them. The structure failed. So actually the structure oh, kind the of collapsed thing. in and prevented those doors from being opened manually or uh, electronically. They actually had to break through their the rear doors to get out of the building. Get them out. Okay. Okay. Did you have a question or comment? Um, I just was going to ask um, if you could just remind me: Is there a time uh, for expending these funds? Is it like three years? We have three years. To three years. Project. Uh, okay. I, I don't anticipate this being a three-year project. Uh, the environmental, pretty much, it's done. Uh, we're gonna we'll file a notice of exemption for the sequel end of things. Um, and here's the facilities plans. So the concept plans already completed, so we have the plans. So we'll be putting out next things, put our RFP out to get the actual engineered plans put together. And then once we have those in place, we can put this project out to bid. I'm thinking next summer? I, I don't see why not. This would probably should move forward pretty quickly. That was my next question was how soon can we begin? As, as soon as we can, we, after tonight, that'll, if you guys authorize a resolution and accept the grant, We'll be, be able to start uh, expending the funding, and actually, some of this work that's been done was pre-construction costs, so we can apply for some of this funding back that we've already expended, uh, and we just move it forward. Uh, we anticipate that our plans checks and, and building inspection, we can probably do that in-house since we have our new building inspector on board. So we'll be able to we'll have a lot of control over this project and be able to move it forward. I, I would, you know, by the beginning of the year, we'll have a. a or in the next month or two, we'll have a, a project, you know, schedule okay. for this, okay. and we'll get that to the council, uh, so we can kind of keep ourselves accountable and, and move this project forward. Within, you know, all the other projects that we are working on and doing, we'll, I'll sit down with uh, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Weir, and see when we can get this completed as soon as possible. Okay. So back to my question a little bit ago: Is there any public input um, on the actual? building itself or have the firefighters had any input uh -oh. work on it. we had meetings and we had a committee of firefighters that talked met with them and talked about what we wanted and how we wanted it done and you know some of the projects aren't including this we're looking at cdbg money for some other uh, changes upstairs and stuff later, but um, but the basic ideas came out of that group. So, yeah, it's not stressed that the the funding is specifically for the seismic upgrades, right. the seismic retrofit. So it doesn't right. give you a lot of input from architectural. Features. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Right. Thank you. you know, any, uh, good. When when we've gone along and 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 uh, enjoyed the controlled burns that you have, I've been real impressed with the the equipment that you have and the and real impressed with the expense of that equipment. Yeah. We need to do this, if for no other reason, to keep that equipment from getting damaged. Absolutely, yeah. Because I think you said the ladder truck was $2 million or no? No, but close to a half. Let's make it, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, forget that it. That's expensive. Yeah, it's you're not, not, you you're not on the budget committee, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to buy add. another one if they're that cheap? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Ladder truck's probably about 700000 these so days. So I'm not so yeah. impressed, yeah. I guess. No, I, yeah. I, uh, no, I appreciate the, the efforts of protecting and, that. And the main thing is we've got to be able to get out of the building. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to get that truck to where it's really needed. I mean, there may not be any lives at risk in the fire hall, 
but what about Crescent Elk or you right. know, apartment buildings all over town and you know, so we, and all the equipment's on those engines, so we've got to be able to access it. Thank and you. I also have a good relationship with the other fire department that has an empty station, so we'll be able to have cheap uh, place to put the engines during the construction oh, stuff. Good. So that sounds good. That yeah. that that other chief? Yeah. Yeah. He, he'll work right along with <laughs> me. Me, myself, and I. Yeah. <laughs> you guys think alike, don't you? Yeah, pretty much. We spent a lot of time together. Any other council comments? They have the same wife. <laughs> All right. Any public comment on uh, our new retrofitting fire department? If not, I'll entertain a motion for this resolution. I happily will move to approve resolution 2013-27. Uh, for the city of Crescent City to designate uh, our city manager as the authorizing agent for the hazard mitigation grant program number 1968PJ008706R, file, Fire Hall Seismic Retrofit Project. Is there a second? Helpful. I'd happily second that. Good. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Would you pull the vote? Yes, sir. Councilmember Shalom? Yes. Councilmember Gastineau? Yes. I happily approve that. Mayor Pro Tem Holly. Yes. And Mayor Mia. Yes. Thank you. We move on to city council items now. Uh, do we have any legislative matters? No legislative matters. City manager's report. Do you have, do you have anything else to report tonight? No? Okay. We'll go over reports, concerns, referrals, council travel, and training. Council Member Murray, I think we'll start with you tonight. Okay. Anything um, to report? Uh, on uh, the 10th of this month, we had the local transportation commission meeting where we had a presentation by Caltrans on last chance grade. And I believe that um, it's open to two lane traffic now, according to our executive director, Tamara Layton, in an email correspondence. Um, on the 15th, I um, listened to Congressman Huffman's town hall on the, um, the government shutdown and learned at the federal level alone, doesn't count the state or local levels, that it was costing us $3 million a day. So I'm glad we have that resolved. And then I um, had lunch with our, um, our league representative, Sarah Rounds, last week, and we have the um, Redwood Empire Division of the California League of Cities uh, location set up for Ukiah in March, Fort Bragg in May, and Blue Lake in July. And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. My report will be brief today. Um, the, uh, for those of you who may not know it, the Solid Waste Management Authority is, is looking at uh, hiring a consultant to look at its operations. And this is in response to a lot of the confusion and concerns regarding the authority. And, uh, and uh, it's become a little bit more formalized. So I spent uh, a, a lot of Wednesday afternoon uh, uh, with Martha Rice and um, Ted Ward looking at the scope of, of responsibilities for this consultant. And so that will be a meeting, a special meeting this Wednesday, I believe. Three o'clock. Three o'clock this Wednesday to, to consider this, uh, this proposal or this RFP. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I think it'll, it'll go a long way maybe to answering all of our questions at the same time by an objective source. So uh, that was, uh, I was out of town for the rest of the time. So uh, that's my report. Councilmember Salon. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> okay, um, so we had a really fantastic sea cruise. The chamber was very pleased with uh, the results. We had about, uh, there were more than 350 cars um, that... I heard the last was 400. It wasn't 400, but I think it was closer to 370-something. Okay. But um, So a great turnout um, on entries and... Um, everything actually went really well. The dance was amazing. Uh, we had, I'm going to guess, five or six hundred people in attendance. And so it was just the, the new uh, band was a huge hit and people had a really great time. There was not one single problem the entire night. So um, I was really pleased with that. Uh, a lot of volunteer work went into this event, so I wanted to thank everybody for that. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Taylor won a trophy for his car. I told you you did. You have to show up for the awards. <laughs> so what, what kind of car do you have? 69 Corvette. Wow. 
He's been holding out on us. Yes. Uh, so congratulations. Pretty cool. Did Mr. Plack win a, an award? <laughs> what are these, these employees enter their cars and then they have to like take off and work or something? So uh, uh, Mr. Plack has a beautiful Cobra himself. So good job, guys. Um, and then this Thursday we have uh, one of our final meetings for the Camden uh, Sutter uh, group meetings. Uh, and I will hopefully tell you more after that. To be, to, be, uh, to be continued. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Council Member Gastineau. Yeah, um, I also attended the local transportation meeting about last month's grade, and it was very informative. Uh, it's unfortunate it takes years and years for these plans to even come out or to get the funding or even to have Caltrans look at something that might be gone in hours, days, and totally isolate us. So at least we're getting it going. We're lighting fires under people, and uh, that's always a good thing. Um, I also attend the bike and uh, their safe bike and walk to school day last Wednesday. Uh, Councilmember Murray was there with me at Mary Peacock, and it was very nice. Uh, uh, my wife teaches there, so I was just Mr. Gastineau that day, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had lots of parents' input, and, and it was very uh, good experience. Um, and then last Friday, Mayor Ani and I met with uh, bid board members Tracy Fansler and Cheryl Corpstein, and we talked about uh, assessments. And currently, only about 20 businesses out of the 90 plus in the business improvement district have uh, paid their assessments voluntarily. Uh, and that brought in a probably about just a little under $2,000. And so, there is no Christmas this year. No Christmas parade, no tree lighting. Um, the Business Improvement District is a very important aspect of our community. Uh, I remember lots of people in here, uh, heated discussions about how if it was voluntary, they would pay. And I don't see them on this list that we have. So uh, that's an unfortunate thing for our community. Uh, and if the, you know, the bid did go away, if they did a downtown association, it would take at least $2,500 a year for them just to cover their operating insurance costs, not doing any events or anything like that. And under the city umbrella, they don't have to pay that with events. So uh, it was very informative. Um, we're uh, definitely trying to go forward with what we can now with bid, but uh, um, it just doesn't look encouraging for the downtown district or Crescent City for the holidays. So. No Halloween parade either? No Halloween parade either. Anything else? That's it? Okay. The, um, I also attended the the sea cruise both Friday and Saturday, and like Kelly said, it was a great it was a great thing. Went to the chamber mixer last week, uh, that was held at Club okay. Twenty Twenty. You were there too. Club Twenty Twenty. Is it called Club Twenty? No, it's called the club. No, they changed the name. They did. Yeah, I think it's called Club Twenty something. Yeah. Well, whatever it is, they could have changed it. Also, uh, um, uh, Councilmember Murray was talking about the El Tico meeting and. I'm the chair of El Tico, and our vice chair, Supervisor Hemmingson, and I will be meeting in two weeks, maybe two weeks, with Congressman Huffman is coming up, and he wants to tour that area of Last Chance. And of course, they just took the signal light out today. He's coming in two weeks, and so he wants to he wants to come up there and tour the area and familiar familiarize himself of all the stuff that's going on there all the reports we've had done over the years, the cost, and as you know, that's a U.S. highway, and we're hoping that he can help us through federal money, too. So he is very interested, and he will be up here to, uh, to go over that, that area with us. It'll be uh, uh, Tamara Layton, our director, uh, supervisor, uh, uh, Hemmingson and I, and uh, Caltrans, and state parks, national parks, and the Forest Service. So I'll report out on that meeting after we do that with the uh, congressman 
which is which will be in a couple of weeks what about green diamond? and green diamond thank you green diamond also and so that's will be that's will be meeting there the um, I think that's about all that I have for tonight we are going to adjourn to a closed session we still have some items to talk about in closed session so thank you for coming this evening our next meeting will be on Monday November 4th meetings adjourned